guess we can start with some of the followers that are a little bit late, uh, they'll tune in. But I uh, want to thank you all for tuning in. This is our second uh, webinar. It's a Q&A to follow up uh, from our very first one, uh, which was um, interesting with the feedback that come back. We want to answer some of those questions. Uh, before we begin, though, uh, it's uh, customary and it's important that we acknowledge uh, the traditional owners. Uh, the Wongal uh, people were the, can, uh, the custodians of this beautiful land and water that Gunawira resides on. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the spirit of the land, the spirit of the, <laughs> the, spirit of the people. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge and pay my respects to elders, past, present, and emerging. Uh, acknowledge any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander person that's uh, looking at us right now, and acknowledge and pay my respects to your land, to your country, to your people. Um, yeah, look, uh, this will always be Aboriginal land, and we should always remember that right across Australia, uh, wherever you travel, it will always be Aboriginal land there as well. So uh, without, with, without further ado, I'd like to once again welcome everyone uh, to Gunnawira's webinar. Um, uh, I'll let these uh, amazing people around me introduce themselves once again, uh, a little bit about themselves and what they're doing out there in, in their communities and what they're doing uh, with their work. Uh, look, I'm very honoured that uh, I've got a great family around me of people, uh, passionate, committed to, to looking after our mob. And through these webinars is the way that we can get uh, people like yourselves uh, more connected to uh, an ancient people and an ancient culture. So, um, yeah, I'll pass it over to Miriam Kavanagh, who's our Gunnawira Chairwoman. Thanks, Brian. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much for attending today. Lovely to see so many new faces as well. Um, my name's Miriam Kavanagh. I'm the uh, Chair of Gunnawira. Um, my background is, for those who haven't, the last meeting was, I'm of both Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander background. My dad, I was born in Redfern. Um, on my dad's side, he's an Aboriginal man, and my mum is from the Torres Strait Islands, so she's from uh, the Western language group. So I come from a small family of 10 as well, so we were around, we were around for TVs in them days. So just to have culture come back in, um, I love being here at Gunawira, helping to make it and strengthen in the Torres Strait Islands part of it, because um, I feel that here in Australia, we don't talk about the Torres Strait Islands so much, because um, when we're talking about our greetings and how we do stuff and how we connect with country and um, like with food, same we all have our different ways and how we heal in our journey going forward. So to be part of this team here, um, my role is to help come in and to be part of the team and uh, to move on slowly uh, on a healing journey all together. So we're all here as a family. As a family. To me, it's like moving forward. So. I've been part of Gunnawira for a while, so now I'm just to move forward with everybody as well. So uh, I'd like to pass on to Brendan. Thank you, Mary. <laughs> um, how are you going, everyone? My name's Brendan. Um, I've got a few different last names. Uh, my adopted last name is Kieran. Um, my, my proper blood last name is Mitchell. And I have a skin name of Japanadi um, from Central Desert Connection. Um, uh, Aboriginal, and there's a bit of Irish blood in there as well. Um, and then, look, I'm, I'm part of the Stolen Generation. Um, in 1971, I was removed from Crown Street Women's Hospital at Surrey Hills. And a little over five, six years ago, I found... I found my mother's country. Um, I never got to meet my mother. She passed away three years before I, I, um, I, I found my auntie. Um, I found my mother's grave. 
Um, and I'm one of 10 that were removed and second generation removed. Um, what I do now is I'm a trauma specialist counsellor and I'm currently working at an organisation called Link Up. Um, Link Up help um, stolen generation return back to, to country and reunite with family. Um, and so I'm the reunification counsellor currently with Link Up and, and I do just about everything you can think about culture. Um, um, stone tools, carbon, singing, dancing, painting, um, just about everything. And so for me, the whole trauma, healing and, and culture um, go hand in hand. And um, here to, to support Brother Graham here in, in, uh, and Gunawira. Um, big believer in, in what Gunawira does and, and, and that's what I'm here to do. I'll hand it over to Eve. <laughs> Thanks, Brenda. That was good to hear, hear that about you. Uh, my name's Eve White, and I'm helping at Gunawira with the, the YAMP, the Mothers Program. Um, I am very proud of all of the roots that I have, and uh, my mum is from Parks and my dad, he's from Dubbo, but I think he's also got links um, in Melbourne. Uh, I was born in Kuringai, um, Pennant Hills, um, but I now live in, in Bondi where I feel like I've always had a, quite a deep connection to the salt water, even though um, my family's connected to the fresh water. Um, I've been with Gunawira for a few months now um, and I'm a, I'm a yoga teacher and I also teach Qigong which we were just yarning about. Um, Qigong is energy cultivation so I'm really interested in working with a person's energy and to learn and, and rediscover uh, the way that we can start to use our own energy to heal ourselves and to like clear blockages and with that to help clear trauma and you know to, to energize and um also i have little things that i do that help with headaches and um i do this thing called meridian tapping where you tap 360 plus meridian lines of the body um and you talk to your organs <laughs> Uh, which is, is really interesting um, to, to sort of connect in that way to the inner workings of your body where I feel that um, we've lost a lot of connection to that as we're so focused on the outer the workings of the body. Um, and I have been working with the moms mostly on a Wednesday at the mothers group here. We um, brought them online. Uh, when we were in lockdown and that was really nice just to um we sort of did different things each week we did some meditation and um vision boards and yoga and dancing i'm also a dancer i've danced um many different cultural dances from all over the world um but i've sort of come back to re re-explore and rediscover um aboriginal dance um so, yeah, I could keep talking, <laughs> but that's enough. Um, so thanks. I feel very privileged to sit here with these, these guys and to be a part of the Gunawira family. Um, I think it's really important that we start at the seed as what Gunawira means and we sort of explore life from, from that place. Uh, Katrina. <laughs> Can't forget, yeah, Hi everyone, <laughs> I didn't know I was speaking but <laughs> I'm Aboriginal social worker here, um, I run the YAP program each week, um, I'm from Darug Nation so Kritika, it's nice to know you're on my lands, <laughs> um, yeah just thanks for attending and you know replying to all my emails and yeah thanks. <laughs> okay um, yeah for you guys who don't know about me, um, my people are the Warramunga people of the Wiradjuri country. 
uh, New South Wales. Also I have a family connection to one Jiaven country, which is further west. Um, I, I feel really blessed that uh, I have Aboriginal blood in me. Uh, it gets me the opportunity to have moments like this where I can share that with you people. And you must be all good people because you're tuning in and you're interested uh, in what we've got to say. And I hope that uh, the next hour or so that we can give you something to take, whether that's your workplace or in your private life out, outside of Gunawira. Um, so look, everything that all of us say here today is uh, as individuals. Uh, yes, we do represent our, our country and our communities, but what we do uh, share is uh, most of the time is as a person, okay? Sure, we can talk about what Wiradjuri people, uh, their customs are, what their totems are and, and their culture, but still, um, you know, I just want you to be mindful that what we do share with you uh, is coming from an individual side of things most of the time. Okay, so look, as we, uh, for those who didn't tune in last time, um, we had a great session where there were some questions that were raised out of that. And please, as we're talking right now, if you've got questions uh, as we're moving towards uh, the end of this webinar, that we can answer those hopefully during the time or we can come back to those in a month's time. And look, we have big plans of running these webinars every month. So if your question's not answered tonight, we'll certainly get to it. And Katrina is the one that's um, also looking after the emails that are sent through. So if you wanna send a question through an email, we can answer things uh, that way as well. So look, some of the questions and there, thanks for everyone that sent us the answer, uh, the questions to for tonight. But one of those questions was about um, uh, Aboriginal people and um, people from, uh, whether they're from different, uh, I'm struggling to come with the right words here. Um, people who um, maybe, uh, what's the word here? So different areas, you mean? No, um, LGBT. different gender. Oh, LGBT. Yeah. So the LGBT. LG. LGBT. LGBTQ. Yeah. LGBTQ. Yeah. Okay, so uh, look, it's over to Brendan, who's kindly is going to elaborate a little bit about the question that was asked around that. <laughs> we had we had a quick discussion of who was going to answer this, and we all said that Graham wasn't going to answer it because he couldn't pronounce the acronyms. Right. <laughs> but listen, um, it was a very good question because um, look, the gay gay and lesbian um, community is not a it's not something with Aboriginal people that started once Cook landed here. Um, we've had gay and lesbian people in our communities for thousands of years. Um, though it's nothing new to us as Aboriginal people. Um, I think what, and, and Torres Strait people, um, I think what we're seeing now is um, the coming out of community with those gay and lesbian people due to the fact that there's a lot more acceptance um, of the gay and lesbian community. And so you've got, um, you know, Aboriginal people that are gay, um, number one, um, becoming ridiculed for being black um, by non-Indigenous people, going through that racism, and then on top of that being gay, um, which made it even harder. Um, and now, as I said earlier, now because of the acceptance and we are where we are with it, you're, you're there now. Coming out for all to see, where it's nothing new for, again, for, for Aboriginal communities. Um, look, traditionally, um, and in some areas in Australia, uh, and especially up in the top end and, and you know, possibly in the TSI um, and other pockets, there's still ceremonies that go on. 
um, in this country. And, and when I talk about ceremonies, I'm not talking about, you know, having a fire and sitting around dancing and singing. I'm talking about the, the, that growth and progression from, from girl to womanhood, from boy to manhood. The ceremonies are still going on in this country. Um, and what would happen, and I, and I can only speak um, around the gay men, um, the gay men weren't allowed to go through if they presented at a very young age as being gay, then they weren't allowed to go through um, and, and do that men's business. So what would then happen is these young gay fellows would end up having to spend time with the women, learning about their women's business. And what, what's happened now is that in, in a lot of communities where these gay men are, they're the keepers of this knowledge because they've sat around with the old girls and they've listened to these conversations. And so quite a few, and I've spoken to a lot of black fellas around this, a lot of black fellas are saying they're not up to date with their song lines or, or who's married to who or who's related to who. But most of them will go back and visit the gay fella because he's the one that sat around and listened to the women and the aunties talking about these marriage connections, who's related to this one, no. And for example, um, a young fellow might come home and he might say, oh, Arnie, I've just met Sharon so-so. And Arnie will turn around and say, no, so you've got to stay away from her because your great uncle married her great auntie. So that's not the right skin for you. So these gay young gay men have grown up listening to all of these dynamics within, within the clan. And as I said, they're now the holders and the keepers of this information. Um, and look, I, they, again, not all gay people are, are born gay. Some will have that transition. So there has been instances where, where these young fellows will go through and do their men's business only to come out after. Um, and, and that's fine as well. There's, there's always been an acceptance because we believe um, everything has an energy. Everything has a soul. And it doesn't matter what you do to that energy or, or you, you can't destroy energy. It's a proven fact. And every living thing has an energy. Every living thing. The birds, the wind, the trees, everything has it. So it's all connected. Um, and, and that's where that's really how how I've grown up with that cultural um, you know, in my father's language it's called Jukurpa and Jukurpa, everything is connected. Um, and if something happens to 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 one part of that connection, then there's a domino effect. And and I can relate that to a lot of stolen generation people now, um, they've lost connection to country, they've lost connection to language, they've lost connection to family, they've lost their song line, they've lost, these are all the things in that Jokurpa that make me, me. And so whether these people, Aboriginal people are gay or lesbian, it doesn't make a difference. We share the same connection. We're all part of the same Jokurpa. Um, so look, and then this question was brought up um, in our last webinar. Um, so I hope um, if that person is on here again tonight, I hope I've hopefully answered or clarified a little bit of that for you. If not, to all the new faces, um, I hope it's given a little bit of insight into, into that, that question. And again, as Gray mentioned earlier, if there's any other questions that, that are coming up while we're having these discussions, then feel free to, to write them down. And um, I think Graham mentioned earlier he's willing to give everyone his personal email. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and his phone number. You already got it. <laughs> <laughs> and being a black fella. Our phones are on 24 hours a day. <laughs> uh, thanks, brother. Um, look, the, one of the other questions that was uh, raised last time was about 
going into Aboriginal communities and, and how to have that greeting, how to, to walk into a community and, and uh, to be, you know, to, to be appropriate, to be respectful, to, to understand um, how to go in there and, and to begin conversations with people. So uh, look, from where, where I sit, uh, uh, many of the staff here at Gunawira uh, go into communities uh, and I sit with those guys um, and uh, we, we run through what's, what is appropriate. And, and it, look, our people are not silly. They can spot someone coming a mile away that is coming with the wrong intention. Um, so what, what's most important is, is to be yourself. You know, you're just a, a human being, a human being like all of us, and to always have a little bit of cultural knowledge certainly does help. Because our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities are weary of people coming in from from um, you know non-Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander backgrounds, right? So uh, what what you need to do is try to uh, learn a little bit about that country and the people there. Um, simple things like um, coming into that country and using some of that terminology that we know is acceptable. And, and uh, if you were to come to me and say, Graham, where's your country? I would immediately feel that you have an understanding and you have knowledge about us, simply using the word country. If you came in and said something like, oh, where is your land? Yeah, that's similar and stuff. But, you know, to use that really, a uh, strong word, country does uh, get you a long way in getting your foot in the door. And then, you know, uh, if you were any of you fellas going throughout Australia and knowing, okay, tomorrow I'm going up to Queensland into Townsville, if you were to go there and you were going to work around uh, Aboriginal people up there, well, it'd be silly not to learn who them people are and what their country is called. But you could come into their country and say, oh, hello, um, you know, I'm Mary. Uh, this is um, whatever that country, it might be Wiradjuri country, okay? So to know someone's country and to be able to go in there and say that already knows that, already shows that you have an understanding and you have knowledge, okay? And then you might say something like, well, um, are you Aboriginal or Torres Strait? The word, use the word indigenous. Look, there's a place and a, and a time for that, but working closely with communities and with people, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, always use the word Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander. It's we've fought bloody hard for 200 odd years to keep our identity. And it's one of the things you can't remove from us. You can take us off our land and you can take us away from you know, our families and all that, but as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, that's our blood. That's where we belong and we'll always be part of that. Okay, so I strongly urge all of you to always use that word or those words. Okay, and there's lots of other things like for people in New South Wales, we call Koori people. Okay, for people up Queensland, they call Murray people. So once again, if you're going into state, and you're certainly not going to do it right now because of COVID, but um, look, if some, one of you fellas to come up to me and say, hello, Graham, uh, where is your country? You're an Aboriginal person. Uh, you're from Wiradjuri country. you are already got me uh, on the same page as you, okay? So there's just some simple things like that, um, some simple terminology that can really help with you, um, you know, developing that relationship or moving into that place. And the other thing is just being respectful. You know, it's like if we went over to America or we went to another country, you'd, you'd be mindful of the, the culture and the people over there. You know, so Australia's just lucky that we've got 350 nations within Australia. And, you know, they're, they're always going to be there. They always have been there. I think what we need to do is come up with those books that you can you can buy when you go to Mexico. You can buy a book on Mexico, and it gives you all the language and the translations and the spots to go and see. 
we should have one for each tribe. Mm. <laughs> yep, I agree on that one. And language, there's such a diversity in language and greetings in, in Australia. Um, Koori, the word Koori in Queensland, some parts of Queensland, actually means dog. Mm -hmm. So if you were to go to Queensland and say, are you Koori, yeah. you can see the trouble that's going to create. Mm. Um, but as Graham said, you know, we, we, we've, we've, I've been around white fellas my whole life. My whole life. How many have of you have been around black fellas your whole life? So I, I, and then Graham and these communities and Aboriginal communities, we've we've been around white fellas our whole lives, and and you know we we're used to you know, organisations popping up on the back of funding and using our community and our, our our people in order to access more funding. And then when they get that funding and they get those black bums on the seats, we never see these people again. But yet those communities, communities are still um, struggling with, with, you know, accessing services and, and a whole lot of other things that's still going on. And then this happens all the time. And then we get a change of government. And that just pulls everything un from under us again. Um, but it's, it's like anything else, you know, you just keep chipping away. You just be upfront and honest and transparent. Um, and, you know, we're, we're just normal people. And, and look, they're, like every race, there's a group of people out there that, that are full of anger and, and, and have their flaws in their characters. Um, and you, so you're going to cop that within any race. I mean, I, and I cop it within my own, with other Aboriginal people as well. So it's not, it's not a, I don't see it as a colour thing. I just think it's an individual thing. Um, and I, I always work on the three brain theory. And, and Kylie, you, you probably agree with me here. When you're hungry, it's not the head brain that tells you to eat. It's the gut brain. So we have the gut brain, the heart brain, and the head brain. And, the, and these are the three brains that I, I constantly use. Um, we've grown up in white society and white society has trained us since we were little to forget about the heart and the gut and just to use the head brain. You know, but I've been in situations where my heart's telling me, oh, I don't feel safe. I don't feel safe here. And the adrenaline will spike. That's from the heart. It's giving you that adrenaline and the fight, flight and freeze. That's all coming from the heart. So that's, that's, that's how I've been brought up. Um, but again, we, we're no different than anyone else. Some of us are a bit better looking than others and that can't be helped. Um, that's how I was born. <laughs> I think the other thing too, supporting like what Brendan's saying, like from the Torres Strait, like the Torres Strait Island part, um, what you have to remember too, there's like you've got Aboriginal culture and Torres Strait Island culture. So they are two unique cultures as well. So we um, have to understand that as well. So when you're introduced, like when, because I work in a, um, in a lecturing in, uh, and when I'm doing cultural clinical stuff around Australia, um, I get like students and other members, um, what we do is we introduce ourselves because, I mean, community actually know who you are. So when you're actually going to turn up, they can see you a mile away. So, I mean, just be yourself. Try not to be something that you're not as well when you go to community because, I mean, if you go to the Torres Strait Islands from here to up Cairns and catch another plane, I mean, you stand out like a beacon light when you go to the island because, I mean, you're walking around like a tourist. So... It's a long way to swim back to mainland Australia. So, I mean, yeah, so you have to just be yourself when you're doing stuff. So try not to be something that you're not. Um, and when you go there, go with a good heart because if you don't go with a good heart, you, get, you stand out a mile away. So, I mean, I was brought up from, with a big family and I have millions of nieces and nephews around Australia. So we instill that in our family. You have to be kind to be, you know, to move forward as well. So if you're not kind to that person, it always comes back and bites you. So... Just be mindful, be yourself when you're travelling anywhere in Australia because, I mean, um, Aboriginal grapevine and Torres Strait Islander grapevine is the best in Australia because we're faster than what, what do you call it, NBN, 
all that stuff. So I mean, yeah, 5G, 5G, all that stuff. So yeah, just to be a friend, we have friends for life when you're with Aboriginal people or any culture. It just comes back to trusting and not burning your bridges both things as well. So that's how I've been instilled and to be on board with these guys here. So to move that journey further for us to go on as well. So that's how I look at it as well. So just look at yourself. If you want to learn about the trust around, I'm happy to teach you. But if you burn my bridge, you burn the whole borderline as well. <laughs> so when you look when you when you come into community as a worker and and I'm not picking on any service or, or organization, let's say Mission Australia. As a Mission Australia worker, you come into my community. I don't want to know about your who you work for. I want to know about the person. So you you are the person first, and then your organisation. That's that's how it is. And a lot of people will come in as the organisation. Um, and, and the perfect example of that is those blokes and people that you'll see at shopping centres that are trying to get you to donate money. Um, and I, 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 I sometimes I, when I'm feeling in a good mood, I'll sit there and I'll stop and have a chat with them about stuff that's got nothing to do with what they're trying to sell me or try to make me do. They're there solely as a representative of that organisation and they have a purpose and an agenda. But once you start talking to them about things that's not related to what they're there to do, you'll see them start to get lost in conversation because all of a sudden they're not talking about their, their speech. They're not talking about what they're there to do. You've now swapped their brain over to the other side and you're actually having a conversation to them as a person and they're not used to that. That's not what they're there for. And, and so that similarity with organisations working within Aboriginal communities, we want to know the person first. We want to know what you're like. Introduce yourself. Mm. And then, you know, a couple of weeks later, um, many cups of teas, it's, it's said, for engaging with our Aboriginal community, many cups of teas. And that's how long it'll take us to get to work you out first. Mm. And then if we work you out and we think you're all right, then we'll trust you and then we'll start talking about the organisation you represent. Mm. Yeah, look, I hope that covers it. Look, I just want to quickly say hello to uh, the aunties up there in Gallagher Preschool on Dungutty Country. Uh, <laughs> wish I was up there with you guys, miss you all. Uh, I can notice a, a few other people scattered around, but uh, just quickly, uh, thanks for the questions that are coming through. Uh, and there's one from uh, who must be very in tune with Aboriginal culture. She says, um, I'm joining in from Darug land. land. So, uh, Karita, is it? Your question about uh, skin and you want to know a little bit about kinship and skin. Uh, no better person to answer that is Brendan. Oh, <laughs> skin. Skin and kinship, very big topic um, and, and a lot of links. So hold on to your seats and let's go on this journey. Skin name and clan names were designed and for, for many different connections and reasons within community. Um, through skin name, it stopped incest 13 generations down the line just through a skin name. Um, I'll give you an example. So my skin name's Japanati. If Miriam's skin name was Napanati, then Miriam is my skin sister. And skin sister is the same as blood. So let's say if Miriam was from, or Miriam is from Torres Strait Island, her mother is also my mother through skin which is the same as blood. So if I, no matter where I travel throughout the territory, if I come across a Nangala, and Nangala women are mother for Japanati and Napanati, if I come across a Nangala woman and I've got nowhere to stay, she has to take me in because I'm her skin son. Does that make sense? 
Therefore, what that means is I've got lots of mums, lots of dads, lots of uncles, lots of aunties, lots of skin brothers, skin sisters, um, and it didn't leave me much room to misbehave. That's why I come down here to Sydney, because you've got eyes and ears everywhere. But it always, it did, it stops that intermarriage just through, through name, 13 generations down the line. On the other side of the skin name connected with skins is how we marry. So that, that, that desert mob, you have a choice of three to seven wives. Um, all Jagamara men can marry seven wives. And that connection is because they're sisters, the Nakamara women, they're the seven sisters in the, in the sky, in the Orion belt. There's a cluster of seven stars up there. And those Jagamara men related to that story. So Jagamara men can have a choice of seven wives. Now here's where it gets really complicated. Jagamara men are Japanese first cousins. So we can steal each other's wives. I can't steal his first choice, but he can steal my second choice and I can take his third choice. And, and I'm only talking about first cousins. I'm not talking about second, third, fourth, because then it gets even more confusing. So what can be my first choice of a wife for wife can be second cousin's third choice for wife. Then after seven years, the skin name changes. So the son of Japanati men are Jangala. After seven years, it changes. So the Jangala now becomes father for Japanati depending on the age. <laughs> Is everyone with me? <laughs> okay, oh, let's use it like, like with animals. Cockatoos will only marry cockatoos. Kookaburra only marries kookaburra. Cockatoos look all the same, but they've got their own skin names going on in that, in the, in the, within their flock believe it or not, they know who's who. Um, kookaburras, they know who's who. We look at kookaburras and they all look the same, but kookaburras know what's going on. They know, oh, we can't marry this one because that's in this territory. Oh, but we can marry that one because that's outside of our territory. So skin name is right across the territory. It'll go all the way up into Arnhem Land as well, except because of the language, the skin name changes just a different language. And then it's related all to totems. And I, and I think we had a question from last, last time about totems. Now totems um, are, are hand in hand with skin name. Um, if Graham lived, let's say if Graham lived in Redfern back in the day, and in Redfern, all the wallaby would go to Redfern, that's where they, they eat, sleep, breed, have their babies. That's their home in Redfern. That would become Graham's totem. And only Graham and his family can paint the story of, of that wallaby. They can't eat that wallaby because that's family for them. But they become the security guards of that wallaby. And they, they, they hold on to the stories of that wallaby. Paintings and dancing and song. Everything you could ever think about that wallaby, Graham's family's got that knowledge. If I lived, let's say, Balmain, and I have all the guanas, sand guana, all sand guana would come and sleep, live, breathe, and rest in Balmain. I would become security guard for guana. I hold the knowledge of where they eat, how they eat, how, what, they, what they look like when they sleep. All that knowledge about Guana, I'm now a custodian for, for that story. I can't eat Guana. I can walk two or three days to go and see Graham's mob and I can hunt for wallaby. Graham can walk two to three days to Balmain and he can eat Guana. We have an unwritten law. Because we all have respect for our own totem, I know that if Graham comes over and eats my totem, 
I know that he's going to bury a part of that animal in the ground out of respect. He knows that I'm, when I come hunting for his mob, wallaby, that I'm going to bury something in the ground. But because it takes two or three days to walk into each other's backyard, I'm only going to grab what I need. I'm not going to overload because I can't carry six wallabies. I'm only going to grab one or two. And vice versa, Graham will grab one or two with Griner. Now, picture that on a nationwide scale. We never had any species in this country wiped out. Never. In New Zealand, they had the mole bird. They wiped that out quick smart. It was a big bird, bigger than an emu. It was gone. They wiped that out. In Australia, we never wiped out any species because of totem. And so that, that whole totem system is married in with the skin system. Mm -hmm. The Torres Strait Islands, it's the same as well. My totem is um, the turtle, the green, the green turtle. So in Torres Strait Island, our culture, speaking on my family side, um, we're navigators of the sea. So that's where um, our totem comes from, is just the navigators of the sea. Uh, we say like the whales or um, they're the, the brains of the sea. And then you have like the dolphins, we say they're the hearts of the sea. So different animals have different areas for eastern, western and central to the Torres Strait, like exactly what Brendan's saying. So you can't eat, eat that totem because that's your cousin or your brother or your, any of your kinship. So that's things like that. So what Brendan's saying as well. I, 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 met a, I met a young black fella and he said to me, oh, I've got 20 totems. And I said, you got 20 totems? He said, yeah, I've got 20 totems. I said, well, what do you eat? Because <laughs> you can't eat your totems. <laughs> what, do you, what do you eat? <laughs> but this is where it gets confused. Some people get confused because, again, they've lost those song lines. And they've lost those stories that connect them. There's no way you can have 20 totems. Does it make sense? Yeah, if you eat your own totem, then you can get sick. I bring bad karma to your family. It might, like, it might move to your family now, but it can make a ripple effect to the next generation and generations after that as well. You have to just be mindful. Um, when you're having that respect and going on people's countries as well. So um, when they're actually offering and who's, who's actually doing stuff as well when they're cooking um, the different totems. So you have to just be mindful where you are as well. Yeah, and we, we touched a bit about identity and how important it is for our people. Uh, and totem is a, is a big part of our identity as people. It comes from where we come from. It's about our children, uh, giving them uh, the same connection. And look, for, for my people, uh, uh, my uh, totem for my family or my clan or my tribe is the possum. And my father told me, you know, um, when I was very young, that you come from the bloodline of the very first possum that was ever created. And if you think about that, that's, you know, it's so so valuable for us. And when, when we talk about having uh, this identity as people, you know, and, and having, you know, something as, as special as that uh, flowing through our bodies is just, you know, we, we, I feel very blessed that I have that and I'm able to pass it on to my children, you know, and, um, you know, once again, our country, our, our identity, uh, is, is important to us and um, look, Gunawira wants to have more of these webinars. We'll have a break in about 10 minutes, give everyone a bit of a breather and come back and, and answer some more. But uh, Gunawira really wants to cover a lot of culture over the next, uh, up until November, having one of these every month. And we want you guys to provide some of the feedback in what you'd like us to cover uh, with those webinars. And there's so many topics that uh, is important to try and share. So, uh, yeah, but for now, look, there's been another question about 
acknowledgement and welcome the country. Uh, and there, there's two big differences here. Uh, who would like to have a, a dig at answering a question about an acknowledgement and a welcome? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I should probably stop, shouldn't I? I've just been listening. It's yeah. so good to listen. Yeah. I, I just wanted to add on from, um, you know, like you were saying, Graham, with your connection that you have um, with your your totem. I wasn't given that connection with with a totem, with a dreaming, with a spirit animal. Um, my my family, I guess, is from denial. Um, and so what I was sharing with Miriam before, I, am, I have three kids and uh, I do connect more with my mother's aboriginality. And I remember when my youngest, my third one was little, he was just born. And my mom come around and she's like, Eve, you've got to go, go to the backyard. There's baby birds in your backyard. Um, and she forced me to like go down there and like I was trying to get the kids all ready for school. Um, and then I went there and went through the bush and found these baby birds that had fallen like really far from their tree. And so me and the kids made all these nests for them. We thought they'd pet them. The mom would come and get them. So we put them in the backyard and then the cat tried to get them. And we made lots of different nests and fed them. And they were, they were baby kookaburras. Um, and, you know, three weeks later, they looked like full grown kookaburras and one by one they, they flew off. And so um, I've given my youngest child the kookaburra um, as, his, as his dreaming is that animal for him to care for. Uh, he, he was born um, in Bondi. And so that's his sort of where he's been born. So, um, you know, finding these symbols in nature when we live in this modern day world, when we do, you know, come from so many different paths as, you know, as Aboriginal people, but also as, as people that are then, you know, caring for the earth that we live in, um, being able to find these little symbols through, through animals. Um, so for me, that's, that's how I kind of found my connection. And it's not, not so much tradition. Um, I think tradition as well, what I've heard in Wiradjuri, country is that the father he um would be out sort of walk about and a baby animal would come to him and that baby animal would be symbolic that he's going to then have um a child and then you would sort of be intentionally created and I think that that's a really interesting thing to think about is that um you know there's there's the process of obviously being with with child being pregnant but beforehand to um that preparation that goes into that um which i i connect with to to get the body you know ready for this child and these beautiful practices that we would have to um you know bring life into this world in that way um so i just wanted to share that because i often get children where I teach they're like they say to me oh how can I get a, a totem animal um how can they find that connection if they don't so yeah looking at those symbols in nature um yeah, yeah just with this question about acknowledgement of country I think this um person is asking like if they were on Miradjuri country and they don't wanted to acknowledge country they're asking um what is appropriate as far as the traditional custodians and um, those sorts of things. So like, like I said before, um, uh, you know, people sometimes can think of an acknowledgement of country as this formal way of thanking and of respecting and it, it needs to come from the heart, you know what I mean? And it, it, if, if someone, a, a non-Aboriginal person's going out in their, into a community or, or have an event and they want to acknowledge a country, well, it's not so much important that you're acknowledging Wiradjuri or Bunjalung or whatever. It's acknowledging the fact that Aboriginal people are the traditional owners and they're always going to be the traditional owners. So if you're hesitant in, in um, doing an acknowledgement, you know, and one, once again, acknowledgement is for someone like a non-Aboriginal person or a person that's not 
directly connected to that country, right? So it, it's about coming from the heart and just acknowledging paying respects and, and doing a decent thing and, and just acknowledging that, that Aboriginal people were here, are here, and play an important role still on that country that you're having your event, you know? So it's just a decent, to me, it's just a decent thing to do. You know what I mean? And it doesn't need to be, look, I've come across many people uh, over my time and I'll, I'll say to them, okay, do you want to do an acknowledgement of the country? And they go away and they come with this bloody sheet of paper with all this wording. And I say, hey, you know, what, what's that? And he said, oh, well, I'm going to do an acknowledgement of the country. Is that really you or is that someone you're pretending to be? There's no pressure here. Just let it flow out. Whatever you say is not going to be the wrong thing. Sure, you can go down the road of acknowledging that you're on a different country and acknowledging different people, but you don't need to go there. You're just acknowledging the fact that Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people are part of that community and simply pay respects to them. And pay respect to the land as well. It shouldn't be a pressure thing. It shouldn't be a, a, a formal thing. And I know too many clients now and I cringe all the time, particularly with politicians uh, and, and people of authority and power, that there, there's just this one liner. Well, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners, pay my respects to the elders, past and present. That's it. Done and dusted. You know, it's got no soul to it. It's just this line that just, where everyone's saying it. And I know that people years ago down in Victoria, they wanted to get rid of a welcome the country and acknowledgement the country because they felt as though that it was over overused. It was it was um, being said too much, you know. But uh, like I said, to me, it's just a decent thing that all of us have a right to do. And I encourage everyone listening right now to you know at an event or, or even at home with your family at Christmas time. You know, just hey. Let's acknowledge that these Aboriginal people were here 10 to 60,000 years ago or so, and, and they're still here, you know? Doesn't mean that you know, you're taking away that uh, your house is, um, you know, it takes away that you still own the house, but, but embedded underneath all that house is, is the fact that Aboriginal people and the footsteps of Aboriginal people were walking across there. Okay, so I, I hope that's sort of covered uh, that question, but please, it's not about uh, writing something and, and, and you know doing that sort of stuff. Just let it let it come out. And yeah, Does anyone else want to say anything about that? And the welcome is completely different again. It's the welcome is only done by a uh, traditional person from that on that country, so they're the only ones allowed to do it. An acknowledgement, anybody can do it if you if you like what Graham was saying coming from the heart and being genuine about saying, acknowledging country that you're on, acknowledge the people and who your colleagues that you actually work with as well. So that's showing, to me, that's showing a very high respect. So a welcome to country is only done by traditional people of the country. Acknowledgement can be anybody from around Australia or even if you're doing it on an international level as well. So you're acknowledging the, the people, the, like the ancestors of that country. Uh, and just quickly, while I think of it, and I, I said a few minutes ago, hello to my, uh, the aunties up there in the preschool and Bungaddy country. Well, I just want all you fellas to know that them aunties are not my aunties. And they're certainly not Aboriginal people. They're not Aboriginal people that have the honour and the role of being called aunties because they're working around our mob and they do an amazing job up there with the children and the families and the community, and they have the honour of being called aunties. And I'm sure that you've heard of Auntie Norma Ingram out there that does a wealth in the country on Gadigal land, blah, blah, blah. She has the honour, even though that she's a Wiradjuri woman, she's part of the Gadigal country, part of their community, because she's worked uh, tirelessly in that community. And it's the work that she, and the role that she has on Gadigal country that gives her the right to do a welcome to country. Okay. Just one one quick thing with acknowledgement. When when an acknowledgement is done at a meeting, and I don't know if everyone's seen this at a meeting, 
Um, every person, every speaker that gets up feels as though they have to do an acknowledgement as well. Once the acknowledgement is done, there's really no need for every other speaker to get up and do an acknowledgement. That's just how I feel. I, I sit there and go, oh, here we go. Here we go again. He's, he's got, oh, I too would just also like to acknowledge and then the next speaker will get up and oh, I too would also just like to acknowledge. It. Well, you can only say please and thank you once. <laughs> so just with, the, with an acknowledgement, I, I would prefer anyway. Um, but once it's done the first time, it doesn't have to be done with every speaker that gets up. It tends to take the power away from that first one. And like you were saying before, Graham, about how traditionally you do it to not just to, to not an audience, but to, you know, to, to announce yourself to, to spirit, you know, to, to announce yourself um, in that area to not even have an audience, but traditionally it was it was a practice that was done when you would, you know, arrive in in another person's country. Um, yeah. Yeah. So look, uh, let, let's have a, a, a quick ten minute break. Grab a cup of tea or something, and um, maybe yes. during that time, if you think of a question or something you'd like to come back and ask us about, we're happy to answer that. So, so see, see you in ten minutes. Thank you. Same black channel. <laughs> Same black face. <laughs> <laughs>